Is What's it? up, freaks? <laughs> what is up, Miami? Is this year number four? Year number four. Uh, no, there was. And yeah, 19, 20 got canceled. Yeah. 21, 2019, 22. 2019, I told everyone to buy. Smash buy. At 13K, it was the top. And we went down for two and a half years. So. <laughs> All you people who think you're unique, making fun of me for 200K by conference day. Been there, done that. Uh, are we, it's a tradition. Are we going to ask people to smash by right now? We can wait till the end. OK. Um, <laughs> I mean, before we get started, I hope you all have been enjoying the open source stage. Um, it's been uh, awesome to see just a packed house all day out up here. Uh, we got our own little like conference in a conference. Is the is the pirate live stream up still? The pirate live stream is up, so shout out to the mempool team for getting our live stream handled with Bitcoin TV. Um, and just a huge shout out to Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, it's easy to uh, think all this stuff is simple, but it took a lot of people to get this dedicated space. We got the dedicated workshop tables out there. We got our own bar, we got our own bathroom. You can even smoke, smoke cigarettes out on the porch out there. It's like a really well, great We all know life was better before the smoking people. ban, so it's good to see. There you go. It's not banned on the open source stage. <laughs> um, so we'll be closing out the open source stage today. This is the last content on the open source stage, um, and we'll be doing it with all of you. Um, as is tradition, we brought up two ride or die freaks to join us uh, for our live show. Uh, we have Max here from Hoddle Hoddle. How's it going, Max? Good. Being amazing. Thank you for having me and giving me a stage. So, so far, so good. Well, congrats to you on winning the uh, pitch day for Debify. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And then we have everyone's favorite mini script influencer, <laughs> founder of Anchor Watch, Rob Hamilton. How's it going, Rob? Doing great. 2023 is the year of mini script. It's happening. Yeah, okay. You think my predictions are bad? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with it. Okay. Part of standing for mini script has been standing for Ledger because they were the first to implement it in yeah. the wallet. What are your thoughts on this week? So, uh, <laughs> it's unfortunate, right? It's not the way I would ever want to uh, manage uh, private keys. Uh, but ultimately, I think, uh, just very directly, a huge shout out to Salvatore Ngala, who is a true workhorse in being able to, thank you, yeah. Seriously, he, he does a lot in actually being able to take the, like, the idea of this and implement it, uh, writing low level C code and t taking the initiative. And I think the real silver lining here is it lit a fire under everyone else in this industry to realize that there's a market demand for this. There's people that are wanting to build on top of it. And it's now setting a great race, talking to a lot of people this week who are now adding it as product roadmaps for their companies or and for the actual um, signing device companies themselves. They all want to integrate this now because they see what the potential it can unlock. Yeah. So how long do you think it is before Cold Card, Trezor begin? Uh, to my understanding, I think uh, NVK tweeted this out publicly, but he said they just added Taproot. The next major thing they're adding is the mini script support, uh, specifically on their Edge firmware. So there's now a dual track for the cold card firmware. You're, there's your main vanilla one and the Edge one for the bleeding edge features, which right now is Taproot, as well as BSMS BIP 119 Bicure, uh, Bitcoin Secure Multisig setup. And then uh, Miniscript is next on that edge release to kind of delineate between like kind of new bleeding edge features versus this is the, you know. Like a nightly release. Exactly. Yeah. Did you make that for you? <laughs> uh, I don't think it was specifically for me. I think it was, I think it's a great model just to be able to have, have a intermediary stage of playing with new features, right? So you don't have to worry about pushing to your entire user base at once brand new changes because there's a lot of user education and enablement that needs to be done to make sure everyone understands how they're using this tech. Awesome. Um, we kind of jumped into it, but I'm just really curious. Uh, raise your hand if you know what rabbit hole recap is. Ooh. Okay, awesome. So we Thank don't have to do that. Rabbit Hole Recap is, is a podcast Marty and I do every week for four and a half years. It's been. Um, and you've, if you've listened to the podcast, you know Matt is a much better shill than I am. Um, <laughs> we couldn't have done it without all of you guys. So thank you for listening and supporting us. It yeah. really does mean a lot. No, it's crazy to think again. Four years here at uh, the Bitcoin conference. I think four or five years at BitBlockBoom. It's extremely 
Yeah, it's, it's a special feeling doing this show with all of you in person. Another thing we should mention, we have a few topics in our mind that we're going to talk about, but towards the end, we'll open up the Q&A, uh, hoping this year we don't get bombarded by Ben's uh, <laughs> protesting the show. So haven't seen anything yet. Let's keep it that way. Um, but transitioning, Max, uh, you won the pitch day for Debify, uh, and I think sitting here right now, a year after uh, everything that happened with BlockFi, Celsius, Three Arrows, Terra Luna, FTX, the list goes on. Um, last year when we did the show, none of that had happened yet. It's all happened, and what you're doing at Debify is sort of bringing Bitcoin native properties, particularly around multi-sig, to reduce some of the risks that led to those cascading uh, bankruptcies and failures of these companies. So yeah. how... Like the original idea is actually to bring non-custodial approach and a proper Bitcoin standard to the banks and institutions. That's the initial idea because I do think that they, they need to learn and I do think that it's, uh, it's up to us to, to kind of uh, help them to learn that in a proper way, you know, not doing, not, be, not, doing, not being a middleman for the middleman, but actually giving them a glimpse or a taste of what the actual, maybe institutional peer-to-peer -peer means. And yeah, why is multi-sig perfectly suited to reduce the risk that led to the failures? Well, obviously, because it's, there's no re re in the in that model. So we've been doing actually for two years with Land at Huddle Huddle, same approach, and um, we're now feeling that we have an experience and, and power to go to catch the institutions because not only we want to put them on the Bitcoin standard, we also believe that the closest things to the banks is actual lending business because they, the banks initially started in Italy, like in the modern form in 14th, 15th century, because they were lending money to, to those who were going abroad, buying goods, being, being back to Italy. And we think that the lending business is something that bankers understand very good. So we wanted them, we want to present to them Bitcoin as a super collateral because it is super collateral. And the main property that, that actually attracts lenders is that Bitcoin can be liquidated 24 seven. We don't like liquidations. We don't want to like liquidate people, but unfortunately shit happens, you know. And specifically they're over collateralized loans. Right? Yeah, of course. It's a win-win. So like, For a lender, it's a win-win. Always gets the interest payment or will get always the gets the full coverage of the of the loan amount. So it's pretty crazy the the disconnect. Well they really did fix my mic. Uh, there's it's pretty crazy the disconnect um, between like actually people lending on the dollar side of, of borrowing against your Bitcoin because in these particular situations, like what you guys do and what Unchained does, where you have the over collateralized, multi-sig, not rehypothecated uh, collateral, Bitcoin collateral, there's very little risk um, because like you said, you can liquidate at any time and even yeah. if the price drops, it's over collateralized, yeah. so you liquidate it before the price drops below yeah. and you get a very high interest rate and you know these fiat maxis love yield, um, so you would think it'd be very appealing to them. But kind of what happens is like the people who understand that Bitcoin is very strong collateral. I feel like a lot of times just would rather buy Bitcoin. Like I would never lend dollars to one of those loans because I would rather just buy Bitcoin with the dollars. And that's kind of feels yeah, but like the disconnect right now, right? You know their approach. Like most of the banks, they don't want to touch Bitcoin. But, yeah. But uh, like they're not touching it actually. If, if, even if you have especially if you have a liquidation agent in place. So liquidation agent, what he does, he usually, if there's liquidation, just hedges the risk and sends the needed amount to the bank, whether it's a fiat, stable coins, whatever they, they prefer to use, whatever shit coin they like to use, Yeah. right? They're not touching the Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just underlying asset, Right. and that's it. Yeah, and if you compare it to the instruments they're forced to put their dollars in now, pre predominantly US treasuries, it's a much better model for them. You're also just pulling more dollars into the Bitcoin black hole. Yeah. Like this is the Bitcoin ecosystem being capitalized and it's, uh, it's exciting, it's progress. Well, that's, it's funny you said exciting because I actually think it's pretty boring. And uh, I was telling you, I was talking <laughs> to John Seth earlier, but the, to make the point here, like there's an order of operations, I believe, to how Bitcoin will succeed. And we need these boring products like over collateralized lending and insurance products like you're building at Anchor Watch before we can get to the cool, crazy, robust, smart contracts that people like to dream about. 
Yeah, and just insurance is just a concept in, of de-risking markets and under and doing risk transfer, uh, and part of that and you know having skin in the game, right? Like if you are if you're issuing insurance policies, that means someone put money up on the other side of that in the event that there's a claim to be paid out, right? And that's um, a very rigorous process in being able to go through and price that risk, and it's something that just um, accelerates transactions and adoption because uh, talking to people who want to have more Bitcoin exposure, this is not, you know, probably the typical people who listen to the freaks, listen to RHR, but if they want to get some Bitcoin exposure, they already have to take price volatility. They don't have to worry about key man risk where if, you know, what is it if I like lose my key or if like something happens, right? And there's solutions out there like to be able to make it easier to onboard people, but it's not insurance, right? And then what usually happens is they end up going to a custodian because they, what they're looking for is like a fiduciary firewall to know that if something goes wrong, like it's someone else's problem and like, and, like I have a firewall between my company executives or my fund managers and the money itself, right? And uh, because it's a bearer asset and you can just kind of walk off with it, you'd be raising red flags if you tried draining a bank account and you'd be able to maybe reverse a wire, but you can't do that in Bitcoin. So being able to wrap it in insurance is a great way to you know, have, bring more confidence and adoption into it. And I've spoken to many people who uh, actually don't have direct Bitcoin exposure because they can't get insurance on it. And when you get to a certain level of wealth management or fiduciary responsibilities, that's what you're looking for, as someone to manage it properly. And what we're trying to do is push forward the idea of hold keys, not risk, where you're paying an insurance premium, there's a trade-off there, but ultimately um, leveraging things like Miniscript, we can actually have really interesting uh, arrangements building on top of the premises of multi-sig that allow us to over time use time locks and uh, different spending branches and conditions to actually leverage Bitcoin as programmable money in a way that actually brings more institutional capital into the ecosystem. Awesome. Um, I mean, I'd like to change gears a little bit. Can change I? Them. Uh, raise your hand if you're here for the mempool announcement with Wiz. Okay, this mempool announcement is a big deal in my opinion. Uh, I thought the freaks know what it is. You want me to it's run been, through it? What? You want me to run through it? I'm exhausted. It. It's been a long time in the <laughs> making. Um, it's been a long week. It's been a long year. Um, this mempool announcement is really important if mempools never clear again. He might be a mini script influencer, but I'm kind of becoming a mempool influencer. Um, and this, it's, it's this basic concept. It's this basic concept that if you pay a transaction fee right now on Bitcoin, on-chain transaction fee, um, you have to uh, choose, your, choose what, what fee you're going to pay to the miners. And when you're in a situation where you're in a sustained high fee market, when fees are, when there's actually this, this dynamic free market for, for scarce block space that's happening to get included into these finite blocks, um, it's kind of a guessing game. You're, you're picking a fee. A lot of times you'll pick a fee that's way higher than, than what you necessarily need to pay because you want to make sure it gets confirmed. Sometimes you'll pick it lower. You go to mempool.space and you check um, you know, what, what, is, what is the fee to get in in six hours and then the shit corners like flood it with NFTs and the next thing you know like you don't confirm for two months, right? And it's, it's, really, it's really a guessing game. And so the mempool team made a very user-friendly interface on their, on their website, uh, mempools.space, um, that allows you to essentially accelerate any transaction. So if you pay, um, and we were talking about this on RHR, and we were talking about this on Citadel Dispatch in the recent weeks, um, if, you, if you make a transaction, um, there's native Bitcoin protocol tools that you can use to speed up your transaction, like replace by fee or child pays for parent, um, but those have their own UX hurdles and different trade-offs that are made, and, and people say, oh, it's too difficult. Um, there's a lot of friction there, but with this, you can go to mempool.space, you press accelerate, and essentially what it does is you have this, this concept where the miners, mining pools, can opt in and use mempool.space's API to be a part of this program or this service, and once your transaction is confirmed, uh, in the next block uh, through a participating mining pool, then you are charged the fee after the fact. So you end up paying the lowest possible fee that you can pay to get into the next confirmed block. And what that does at scale, like I feel like people don't really appreciate um, how much more efficient that makes uh, the fee market because 
you don't end up in a situation where fees are necessarily going completely out of control, right? Like people are, if you want to get confirmed, you can pay the bare minimum. And it's awesome that it's offered as a consumer product or it's being offered as a consumer product where any person can do it, but where you're going to really see a lot of efficiency gains in the market is going to be where businesses start using it. These large businesses Exchanges. that are sending tons of transactions, now they can keep their fees at the lowest possible amount needed for a confirm without driving the fee market up. Yeah, and I think the other benefit of this particular product, so these accelerator products have existed via BTC, I believe F2 Pool has one. Uh, these are technically out of band uh, Bitcoin payments, so via BTC, you can go to their website. If you have a transaction stuck in the mempool, you can pay them via credit card uh, to, to have them include your transaction in the next block that they mine, and similarly with other pools. And we were talking to Wiz, and he was describing like sometimes, yeah, like another pool would mine the block, but the pool would still take your credit card transaction. Very opaque. It, yeah. Very opaque, and what mempool doing by entering this market as a sort of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a Matchmaker? Or? No, they're like an agno agnostic third party yeah. that is forcing the pools to act honestly. And so you have this third party where every pool connects to, instead of going to pools individually, where they can screw you. Uh, Mempool acts as this sort of arbiter between the transactor and the pool operators to get best pricing and to make sure that they're acting correctly. Which is really exciting, too, because we always joke that, you know, the mempool is Wiz's mempool, right? right. And if he's aggregating and doing the service, you lose, you don't have the problems that you have with out-of-band transactions with shadow mempools, right? And if he's kind of, you know, providing the facilitation for this, he's able to provide a value to everyone that uses Bitcoin and is checking on the mempool and making sure you don't have uh, different s separate shadow markets depending on the pool. So it's just a massive UX win too for the entire ecosystem. And if you've been paying attention, like the mempool team has been shipping like the fundamental building blocks to make this a reality. And one of them was is that auditor tool uh, where the it's the expected block versus the existing block. And that not only allows uh, an individual to verify you know, what was happening there in terms of transactions that were getting accelerated outside of of the Bitcoin network, but also individual miners, right? Like if you're an individual miner and you're part of a mining pool and they're accepting these out-of-bound payments, uh, those individual miners want some guarantees. They want some assurances that they're actually getting paid their fair share, right? Because significant amount of fees, presumably, like we, if we had a sustained high fee market, um, there's gonna be a lot of transaction fees that go through this, this mempool service, right? And as a result, those individual miners are going to want their fair share of the pool's cut. Is it over Lightning? Do you pay over Lightning to? You can pay. You can pay Lightning or on chain. And I think, in typical Wiz fashion, it's also going to support Liquid. <laughs> uh, so the dozen of you out there that use Liquid will be able so, to. Uh, we can pay one sat per V byte to boost your transaction. And it, well, it's interesting because there's an Uncle Jim model um, where you can actually accelerate anyone else's transaction. There's no like authentication if it's mm -hmm. your transaction or not. So if, you know, if one of your friends is like, Matt, the Bitcoin network doesn't work, like my transaction's not going through, like you can go into your mempool account on mempool.space and you can accelerate it. And there's a key thing to keep in mind here, which is a little bit different than the other transaction accelerators, is that you load it up with funds ahead of time. So you like create your mempool.space account, you load it up with funds ahead of time. And the reason for that is, you don't know exactly what fee is required to get it confirmed into the next block until the block actually confirms, right? So you could actually theoretically, if you really do believe mempools will never clear again, <laughs> and you believe mempool.space will be around for a while, you can load it up with low fee transactions now with the expectation that in the future you're going to need to accelerate. Yeah. But okay. Lightning's perfect for this. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really important product, and, and again, I think Mempool is a great company to bring this product forward due to their history of really leaning into open source and being as transparent as possible. I think it's a massive win for individual uh, Bitcoin transactors and then the mining pools as well. Because if you think of it, yeah, like you said, with incumbent accelerators, like they could take the payment and never tell the rest of the pool that they actually took that payment and not disperse the reward. So. This is a good check on that. It's an auditability layer. It's great. Yeah. And then I also, I mean, we kind of said it in passing because Ledger, because he's been talking about Ledger a lot because of Miniscript, but we should talk about the Ledger controversy 
because I've gotten so many messages by people who are freaking out over the last week or so uh, with this new service, Ledger Recover, where they take a Shamir, Shamir secret shard of, of, your, of your key, they take three of them, and then they put them, and it actually overlaps with him well too. They, they take three pieces of your private key, you like press the button on your ledger, so it sends it out to three different custodians that hold one piece of your key each. They do KYC on you, um, and then if you lose your ledger, you can do the KYC to recover, all you need, you need two of those custodians to essentially give you your funds back. Yeah. Let's walk through this. Like, is this just like a PR disaster that just... Well, it's definitely a PR disaster. It was a PR disaster. It might be worse than Bud Light. Um, <laughs> like, the question that has not been answered to me, like, does the introduction of this product prove that the extraction of the key has been possible via some sort of backdoor in the past? Yeah, so... Just very quickly, you can't go for it. You can't do step two. You can't do the elliptic curve math within the secure element. There is no secure element that supports that. So you always, to do the elliptic curve multiplication to generate a signature up to this point, it was always required that you had to leak out private key material. There's there's two things at play here, right? So like first, there's a service, right? And the service obviously has its own trade-offs. You have to do KYC. KYC is the illicit activity, right? It puts you in tons of risk. It doesn't stop criminals. Um, Ledger has a history of having a data leak that leaked a bunch of customer information. Um, obviously, that could be tied to your funds. That part's not great. Um, and then out of the th when you give it to these three custodians, only two of them need to come together to, to spend your funds and move your funds and seize your funds. Um, so obviously, you have collusion risk there, right? And they, they say they have them in different jurisdictions. I think one's in the US, one's in the UK, and maybe one's in France. They're a French company. Um, but like those countries comply with each other all the time, so that, that's obviously a risk. And I think at the end of the day, what's important is that those trade-offs are very clear to users so they can decide if they want to do that or not. I think if you look at it kind of objectively with something like, this is their argument, you compare it to something like Coinbase, where you're doing KYC, but you have a single custodian. This is you're doing KYC and you have two custodians. Two custodians would have to collude to steal your money. It seems like that would be objectively better. Um, but the real, the real kernel that I think people need to take away from this is something we've talked about on the podcast for years, which is the fact that Ledger is a closed source hardware wallet. The firmware is closed source. You cannot verify what an update is doing to your device when you decide to go and update. And we talk about the fact that updates can be attacks themselves. There's a reason why Bitcoin Core does not have auto updates. That's because an attacker can send a malicious update and they don't want it to automatically push to the network. There's a reason that Bitcoin Core is open source, so that you can actually verify what the update is doing. Now, most people will not actually verify what's happening in the code, but some people will. And this is also why we say delay your updates on your hardware wallets, particularly on cold storage, because you let the people that are technical go and check it out. And there's another a whole aspect of this idea of reproducible builds, right? So not only is the code verifiable, but if someone that you trust, and it's kind of like a web of trust, verifies the code, you can verify that you reproduce the same build that they built. So now, Ledger is closed source. And as a result, at the end of the day, you have to trust them when you press that update button. And their users are very ingrained to just press update in Ledger Live whenever they get a new update. Um, there's no way for them to verify it. And you want to talk about a PR disaster, one of their support people on Twitter, before they deleted the tweet, said, you've always had to trust Ledger. And I actually don't think that's necessarily a PR disaster. I think I'm glad that they finally, I mean, they shouldn't have deleted it, but I'm glad they finally, you know, that's the truth. That's the trust model. And to me, that is a non-starter, right? Um, particularly, this stage is filled with people who, who you know, we might not all agree on 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 particulars, on particular uh, <laughs> software licenses, um, but I think at the at the end of the day, um, being able to actually view the code, you know, not necessarily false, um, not necessarily something that you can modify and monetize separately, um, but being able to view the code should be a absolute red line, so you can verify it. 
And uh, Ledger, Ledger does not have that. And this was a wake up call, I think, for a lot of people that that was the case. They didn't even realize that was the trust model. Yeah. So is it like two out of four, basically? It's two out of three. It's two out of three. And yep. then you also have the seed, so you can send it yourself at any time with just the seed. So they, they split your secret in four parts? In or three in, parts. In three and parts. then they send one part each to a different custodian. Yeah, that's with KYC, that's kind of fucked up. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it works if you store in a multisig for a short time period, like, for example, BISC or HODL, HODL or PITCH. But if you're storing a huge amount of money, which is obviously hardware wallets are for, for a long term period, uh, then it's pretty risky. But time. you even said something there. You said multisig. There's a reason they didn't use multisig here was because they wanted to support all the shit coins. So they used Shamir's, which I think is arguably a, a worse model, a less secure model. Uh, yeah, but it's still like the, 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 the mechanics are the same, basically. You well, no, the, the yeah. major difference is that that, that that key material needs to all come together on one device in Shamir's, while in multisig you can sign on multiple different devices, yeah. right? Okay. So like that one device where it comes together, that could, that's a central point of failure. But I think that's, that's, that could be a not very pleasant beginning for the rest of the hardware wallets, like a pressure to them, because I think that could be a precedent in terms of if Ledger is adding KYC. Yeah. That's a pretty fucked up. That's, that's the main problem, not that they are going to offer There's a you. a lot of problems know. here, Max. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> Trust me, I'm, I'm dealing with them for the rest five years, but <laughs> <laughs> not only here, actually. A lot of people think that the problem's only here, but there's, there's a big world outside of US, and there's, there's a bunch of problems out there. But yeah, KYC on hardware wallets, that's, that's kind of a bad thing, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, bad week for Ledger, that's for sure. Uh, don't think we can recommend that to anybody right now. And yeah, a lesson in PR. They completely fumbled that ball. Um, but moving on, you want to open up the questions. We have 13 minutes left. Or do you want to talk RFK? I know you mentioned that before we came on. I mean, I guess raise your hand if you've seen the RFK announcement or speech or political, I guess speech is what we call it. Um, did you guys see it or no? Uh, I Marty, like I like briefed Marty right before we got on stage. Yeah. Um, was it today. Yeah, it was it was no. two hours ago, I think, on the main stage. I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, but U.S. presidential candidate. I mean, uh, fuck politics, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> U.S. presidential candidate, first one to accept Bitcoin. But I think the more interesting thing is like he literally. It was just like whoever his handler is or whoever is. Educating him, uh, it was it was too concise to be a rabbit hole recap listener, so I'm not going to take credit for it. But like he just hit like all the major points. He was like, "Hold your own keys, use your own node. We need mining in America, no mining tax. Like mining's not bad. Free Ross, free Ross. free Ross. He said free Ross. Trucker protest. And then, um, and then another thing, a bold thing he said too is like, "Let's make it a currency. Let's not even define it as property or commodity. Let's." let people use it as a currency. Yeah. Pretty massive. Um, it caught me off guard. I didn't. I was sitting on the news desk while he was. Oh, you were listening? Like, I had a comment immediately afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, shout out to the anonymous freak who's out there, like, training him, I guess. He wasn't, he <laughs> like, wasn't a Bitcoiner six months ago. Or it was, his story is that the Canadian truckers woke him up to it. Or, yeah. It's a good story. It is. <laughs> this Canadian truckers got me on Tucker, so I owe them something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's open up the questions. 11 minutes left. Uh, yeah, we'll take a couple questions, and then we'll do uh, final thoughts. Yeah. Any questions out there? Don't be shy. No question. Oh, back there. She said, Matt, wallet. a while ago you said they're coming for Moon Wallet. Well, we should talk about Moon um, with two U's. Um, Moon Wallet is a wallet we've recommended many times uh, because of its simplicity. It's very easy to use. You're able to pay any Lightning invoice, but all funds at rest stay on chain. And now the, the major trade off that they've always made is that it's not a proper Lightning Wallet. Um, 
And as a result, when you make transactions, when you make lightning, when you make on-chain transactions too, any transaction you make in Moon involves on-chain transactions and the fees involved in them. Um, they also had a, so you don't get any kind of cost savings and when mempools are going, running hot, you end up paying a lot in fees. You don't get any fee savings. And then on top of that, they had a trust model that put themselves at risk um, to, to double spend attacks. Um, they were relying on zero confirmed transactions, unconfirmed transactions. Um, so, and that becomes even more risky during high transaction fee environments where fees are high and it's hard to get transactions confirmed because they sit unconfirmed for a while. Yeah, and during this last fee spike, we saw the most orphan blocks that we've seen in quite a while, which yeah. is not good for these zero. But anyway, I don't know exactly which comment you're talking about or who they is, um, but people were attacking Moon for a while, so it might be, I might have said something to that effect. Um, and I asked people to give them a break and not attack them, which is not a good, you know, it's, a strike it's not a good effect. threat model. It's yeah. just not a good threat model. Like, you can't, like, just ask people to stop attacking you. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, they were racing, Moon was racing, essentially, to release, like, their 2.0 product. Um, and needless to say, they didn't really get it out in time. They didn't get it out in time at all. It hasn't been released yet. And they got an absolutely wrecked, like, my understanding is that they just keep getting attacked. Um, but it's important to realize that at rest, uh, your, transaction, your, your Bitcoin is held as on-chain transactions in self-custody. Um, you have your keys. Uh, they, the way their model works is if they go out of business, you need to use this restore tool where you can sweep. But the point is, like, they can't rug pull you. Um, so like, don't, don't necessarily panic if you have funds in Moon. Um, the straightforward answer is, and I think we said this last week and maybe even the week before, um, because there have been such an outspoken moon shill, is that you just send a low fee on-chain transaction and then hope Marty's right and mempool's clear and then that'll, that'll clear, otherwise you have to maybe accelerate your transaction in mempool.space and just get it confirmed yeah. to, your, to, to a different wallet to get, you know, to just move out of it. Yeah, it's very interesting because Moon, the Moon team were very vocal during the conversation about RBF getting enabled um, by default into Bitcoin Core because, again, as Matt mentioned, they use this model with uh, zero confs and RBF being enabled by default would have messed up that model. and Makes it easier to attack them. And if you go read the mailing list uh, about that subject, they seem to think that there was going to be a lot of time at which mempools were going to clear consistently and their product would be viable, but... Um, Wasn't the case. No, it was not the case. Um, but they are working on becoming more Lightning native. So, And if you're looking for an easy to use Lightning wallet on mobile without running your own node, I really like Phoenix wallet. Uh, it's very easy to use. You just search Phoenix in the App Store. Yeah. Do we have another question? In the back, middle. Thank you. So you say before Shamir is a less secure framework. What do you mean by that? Wait, what was that? Say Shamir. Secret sharing as a less secure. Yeah, I mean the main trade-off uh, is that with multi-sig, um, you're able to sign on different devices, um, and with Shamir Secret, all that key material needs to be on the same computer at the same time. Whether that's a hardware wallet as a computer, or whether that's a MacBook or whatever computer. Um, that's the main trade-off. Like multi-sig, with multi-sig you can, for instance, sign a transaction at home, um, take that signed transaction on a USB drive or a micro SD card, then you can go to your office and then you can take your second signer and then you can sign that transaction and then you can leave your second signer there and then you can go to another location and you can do that and then you can sign again and then you can finally at the end once you have the enough signers that have signed this transaction, you can broadcast it. And as a result, everything that's your private key is never combined on one device that could then be compromised and take all your funds. Only, uh, what's happening is you're just signing this one spending transaction. So you're never putting all of it at risk at the same time, um, which I think is a pretty big trade-off. And one of the reasons why native, multi -sig, native Bitcoin multi-sig is, is so awesome. And I, the reason I bring this up is because 
this idea of using Bitcoin only products and Bitcoin only tools um, is not merely an ideological thing. There's, there's pragmatic reasons why a user would want to do that. And one of the reasons is because you are able to, to, to use native Bitcoin properties uh, rather than rely on things that are kind of Extern. shitcoin agnostic that can support all these things. And then the other reason is because if we go back to you know, verifying updates and verifying code changes and whatnot, there's just less things going on. Right, you're able to make the code base much simpler and much more straightforward and focused and whatnot. Yeah, reducing the attack service surface. Next question. Third row. Hat and glasses. There's a mic coming to you. Can we have a huge round of applause for the audio team that's just been running this day? Test. So uh, two quick questions. On the ledger stuff, is it, I mean, has it ever been a good idea to have Bluetooth in an offline signing device? <laughs> I don't think so. And my other question is for no. Matt, what's your favorite book? <laughs> 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 well, I would say, well, mandibles. No, uh, hey. the drink. Um, <laughs> the Bluetooth, like, look, I mean, it's not for me. Um, I, w I would say, like, at the end of the day, what I want to see in the Bitcoin e ecosystem, me personally, is many different tools with many different trade-offs, right? And, and the reason Bluetooth was chosen by them was because Apple doesn't let you plug a hardware wallet into the USB drive, in the USB port to use it. Um, now, some devices have, have gotten around that through smarter means, in my opinion. Um, foundation and Seed Signer and Jade use QR codes so you can use the screen. You don't need Bluetooth for that. You're able to maintain a proper air gap. Um, cold card, you can use the micro SD with a micro, US, uh, micro SD USB reader works, or you can put it in uh, like drive mode. I don't know what they call it or whatever, but it looks like a virtual drive on the, on the iPhone, and then you can transfer your PSPTs that way. Or you can, you know, Use an Android phone and tap not signer. deal with that. Tap signer, you can tap on the back of a uh, top of the back of the phone. So there's other ways to do it. Um, obviously, the tap things. Well, the tap signer makes a different trade-off, no screen. Um, but you can also tap. I think you can tap the cold card directly on the back of the phone now too. Um, but yeah, that's like trade-offs. The users should be aware of the trade-offs. Um, yeah. Front row. No, Mike's coming to you right now. Thank you. So um, I was talking to a block developer last night. He was talking about Frost, which lets you use um, threshold signatures or thresholds with Shamir um, secret sharing. So you can achieve that multi-sig thing, um, but with Shamir. Mm -hmm. so that was cool. The, the question I have is, um, have you guys heard of L2 and, and Doric, which le essentially lets you have an infinitely opened lightning channel. Like I can keep it open with you for a year or two years because if I have a lightning channel open with you for that long, usually I have to save all of the off-chain signatures. It can really add up and my phone can't store all of that. But with L2 or Doric, I can just save the latest state. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, why is no one working on developing it if uh, if the on-chain fees are rising? I think we need it. Yet. It requires a fork. Yeah, need BIP 118, uh, any prev out to do that. Yeah, it needs a soft fork. I think there's a lot of people working on it, and there's a lot of Lightning developers who are particularly excited about it, but it's it gets um, allocated to Bitcoin Core consensus changes that um, are obviously very, uh, not controversial, they just take time, take a lot of discussion. Bitcoin's hard to change by default. Yeah. yeah. The... So I think a lot of people agree that it'd be an incredible thing to have, and there are people working on it. It's just, all right. How do we get it in? If we're going to do a soft fork, is L2 the only thing we do it for? Is there going to be a bunch of things we do it for? Are we going to soft fork again? So it's just starting a whole somewhat political process yeah. of changing uh, core consensus. Shout out to Jesse Posner working on Frost. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I got to meet him this week. Yeah, great dude. Uh, do we have another question? I'll let you pick. Middle front. <laughs> Sorry, sir. We've got a great mic runner. Thank you. So um, I know that you do uh, custodial loans. I've done it at least like once or twice as far as my business is concerned. 
my question is, um, as far as, you know, Bitcoiners, I'm a dry cleaner. So me in the pragmatic world, I'm not going to ask my dry cleaning customers to send me Bitcoin to pay me. Um, but as far as building your business or other businesses, how do you guys essentially feel about custodial loans? I mean, using, you know, Bitcoin as a tool to essentially build your business in, I'm going to use, you know, normie world. So how do you guys feel about that? Uh, I mean, I can take this as somebody who took out a loan with Unchained to start a business with the standard Bitcoin. Um, for me, I mean, it was worth it. Uh, obviously, there is, it's not really fully custodial, where with Unchained's model, I hold a key, Unchained holds a key, Kingdom Trust holds a key. Um, so somebody taking out that loan and putting Bitcoin up as collateral, uh, I felt comfortable because I had a key in that quorum so I could see the Bitcoin sitting in the address on chain, knowing it's not being rehypothecated, um, and then knowing it all comes down again. We say don't trust verify with Bitcoin, but at the end of the day, humans do have to trust other individuals and companies. And so, uh, when it comes to using your Bitcoin as collateral to take out a loan, I think you look for models like Hodl Hodl and Debify and Unchained have where you at least have visibility into the collateral escrow wallet, which is a multi-sig account. Uh, the, the question was about custodial loans or in general? Especially using Bitcoin to build your business. I mean, I just kind of like want to understand like your ethos, how you feel about it mostly. I mean, I know that you don't know what you're using the loan for. Yeah. So how do you... Um, well, we assume that most of the people, at least on our existing platform, they just borrowing against Bitcoin to buy more Bitcoin. That's the, that's the main use case. <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, for Debify, um, as long as we will add fiat there and we're planning to add fiat, because land at HODL HODL is stable coin based. And it's basically, you borrow shit coin to buy more Bitcoin. So it's, it's okay. It's an intermediary step. But um, for Debify, we're planning to add fiat and most probably People is going going to use that. I don't know to fund their activities, business activities, whatever. Uh, my main issue with ex with existing lending industry is that it's highly centralized, and it's highly centralized not only in terms of storing customer funds like custo custodians, which Unchain doesn't do, luckily. But the problem is that there's centralized liquidity. Uh, basically, any uh, lending platform out there. Everything, the stream of liquidity goes through one entity. With Unchained, it's, it's from Unchained. With uh, Ledin, it's from Ledin. With other companies, it's from them. So what essentially we want to build, we want to build also a free market of, we want to build a lending aggregator, a free market of loans, where lenders going to compete with each other and they are going to like offer different liquidity pools in different currencies with different conditions to people across the globe and you will be able to choose what, what is best suitable for you. Some will offer like, uh, I don't know, 12 month loans with uh, higher APRs. Some will be interested in offering like five years loan with lower APR. So that's, we, we are strong proponents of free market and we believe that it exists, especially in Bitcoin and it should exist and we should build it and we should remove any centralized entity out there. Yeah. I would just add that um, obviously it's leverage. Um, you're taking risk. You want to do some kind of risk management. You want to think about it. But I want to also add that what we saw in the last year or two years um, was a lot of people using um, borrowing against Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And they were doing so mostly on the fully custodial options, right? They weren't using um, the over-collateralized, non-rehypothecated products. They were using the ones that were fractional reserve. And why they were doing that is because the fact that they were then taking your collateral and then lending it out to a bunch of DGENs allowed them to lower your interest rate, right? You're borrowing against your Bitcoin. You're going to get some shit coins for it. You're going to get some dollars for it. Um, you're going to have to pay an interest rate for that, right? And the interest rate for the non-rehypothecated products right now is significantly higher than the interest rate for, for the Ponzi ones, 
right? So as a result, there's this dark incentive that people tend to go to the, to the lower interest rate ones and then they get completely rugged. So um, as Marty always says, like be aware freaks, like that is a, uh, it's a dark incentive. I think a lot of them blew up. I think there'll be a lot of new ones. I think they'll offer very compelling low interest rates and different incentives to try and woo you to their product. I think they will inevitably blow up eventually. I think anyone who tries to do Ponzi banking on Bitcoin will get blown the fuck out. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're doing your risk management. You're doing so good at not cursing. You're doing so good at not cursing. Yeah, I, 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 well, you know, I'm never going to change. I'm kidding. Um, and then also, you know, just stay humble, stack sats. Yes. Don't borrow. Well, then like, more broadly, <laughs> and more broadly speaking, it's like incorporating Bitcoin into your business, like sat streams. I mean, we're lucky we, podcasting 2.0 exists, so we can incorpor incorporate it directly into the podcast, doing that, putting a lightning address in our RSS feed, products like Vita coming out making it easier for us to monetize the RHR live stream using Bitcoin. Um, but then if you're running like a business, like a, a dry cleaner, it's just managing your treasury and making the decision on yourself by yourself, like, all right, what is the amount of my free cash flow that I'm willing to put into Bitcoin and build that part of my balance sheet? So we're running over. I think let's just wrap up real quick with some final thoughts. Rob, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Um... It's good to be here on the main stage, the open source stage. And uh, <laughs> uh, for me, final thoughts are uh, honestly that uh, this is a really exciting time to be building in Bitcoin right now. And that this is, uh, you, you know, the conference is a little bit smaller this year, but I think the vibes are even higher than ever. And that's kind of, you know, building in this market is a real great opportunity. And uh, I'm really excited to see kind of what everyone's going to be grinding on and working on in the coming uh, years, months for Miniscript. I think uh, by the end of 2023, that's going to be pretty great. I had to slide that in there to get Matt. Yeah. Uh, awesome. But stay humble, Saxats. Oh, thanks, Rob. Uh, Max, final thoughts. I actually agree that this is the main stage. So it really has some interesting vibes. So, yeah. Yeah, just uh, try to be as resilient and self-custody as you can, you know, use non-custodial tools. They are, they are out there. They are actually getting better, better with any like month. We, we ship with, we deliver. BISC guy is going to deliver 2.0 BISC soon. Everyone is developing. We're trying our best. And uh, yeah, hold your keys, use non-custodial stuff. Love Bitcoin, hodl, that's it. Cheers, thanks Max. Marty, final thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, uh, thank you guys for coming. Again, it always blows my mind that uh, we get the show out that we do at these shows and probably beating a dead horse, but I do truly believe that what we're doing here broadly on stage, off stage, is very important work, which is making Bitcoin succeed. I think it's virtuous work and I think it's imperative. So if you're here today participating, thank you. Uh, I do truly believe that what we're doing is extremely important. Cheers. Cheers. Um, yeah, I just want to thank all of you. Um, can, show of hands, uh, did anyone come here with a free open source contributor ticket? Wow. That's awesome. Um, cheers to all the open source contributors out there who make this movement possible. Um, and also a huge shout out to Bitcoin Magazine for uh, for that program, we gave out 150 free tickets. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, I know there was, I just want to address a little bit of controversy about the, the stage name open source, not everything necessarily being false on the stage. Um, I will take full personal responsibility on that. I was not trying to like whitewash. Uh, non false software as, as FOSS. It was called Open Source Stage last year when we were building out this program. And the idea was basically a stage focused on freedom tech without noise. Um, and last year it was a little bit more technical because I kind of we kind of like built a stage that I just wanted to sit down and listen to. And then this year it was kind of trying to make it a little bit more accessible. So uh, almost more like a fundamental stage. So like all the new corners that are coming into the conference have like 
a, a place that they can come and, and, and learn the important, uh, like I'm very proud that we've had multiple self-custody workshops. We have a sparrow workshop tomorrow morning, bright and early here. We have a seed signer workshop tomorrow. Um, so, you know, go out, party, but try and get here at 9 a.m. to see Craig Raw and the rest <laughs> of the Sparrow Wallet team for his workshop. And uh, with all that said, wait, I see him in the crowd. I want to give a shout out to Dave as well. Alves Lacrosse um, yes. for all the support in getting we over cancer. Hey. Very stoked that you're fully recovered, man. Like, yeah. You, you were a dirtbag in, in high school. That was really weird what you do <laughs> across. A, a true ride or die freak, and yeah. uh, we love you, bro. Um, no, I was just going to say, like, in about five minutes, Jack Mullers is going to get on the main stage. And uh, it's a pretty big announcement. So if you don't want to miss that, you should go run to the main stage right now. Yeah. And uh, thank you guys.